We come to God's word and a reminder of course we're in 1 Kings and um, we're in uh, 1 Kings 2, 1 to 25 uh, today and should be on your screen. Lovely. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, and show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do, and wherever you turn, and that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, If your son pays close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you also know that Joab, son of Zeruiah, did to me how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed avenging in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals on his feet. Act therefore according to your wisdom, but do not let his grey head go down to Sheol in peace. But deal loyally with the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table. For with such loyalty they met me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. And there is also with you Shimei, the son of Girah, the Benjaminite, from Bahurim, who cursed me with a grievous curse on the day when I went to Mahanaim. But when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now therefore do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man. You will know what you ought to do with him, and you shall bring his grey head down with blood to Sheol. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was forty years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and thirty-three years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, Do you come peacefully? He said, Peacefully. Then he said, I have something to say to you. She said, Speak. He said, You know that the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel fully expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. And now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. She said, Speak. And he said, Please ask King Solomon, he will not refuse you, to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Bathsheba said, Very well, I will speak for you to the king. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. And the king rose to meet her and bowed down to her. And he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother, and she sat on his right. Then she said, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. She said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah your brother as his wife. King Solomon answered his mother, And why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? (laughs) Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my older brother. And on his side are Abiathar the priest and Joab the son of Zuriah. And King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God do so to me and more also, if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has established me and placed me on the throne of David my father, and who has made me a house as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. 
So King Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he struck him down, and he died. Let's pray together. Lord, so much going on in this passage. So many schemes and attempts to gain power and control. Got succession and murder and all sorts of infighting going off. Would you give us wisdom as to what any of this means for us? Trying to faithfully follow you today. We ask then for the wisdom of your spirit to amplify and apply this word to our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, at um, services of ordination, this is now going to be a bit of a struggle as I walk back to try and pick that up. That won't look very gainly on the uh, video. Um, at services of ordination, um, the ordination charge is red. So before you uh, sign your life away, so to speak, they tell you, in theory, what you're getting into. Um, it may well, this may well happen at you know, uh, commissioning of police officers or people in the military. They might sort of read the charge. This is your responsibilities as a police officer or an officer of the military. I, I don't know. Please do enlighten me afterwards um, if that's the case. But this uh, is the charge read to ordinance um, for presbyteral ministry before they are uh, ordained. Um, I won't read it all, just this bit. The president that's ordaining says, In his God's name, you are to preach by word and deed the gospel of God's grace, to declare God's forgiveness of sins to all who are penitent, to baptise, to confirm, and to preside at the celebration of the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, to lead God's people in worship, prayer and service, to minister Christ's love and compassion, to serve others in whom you serve the Lord himself. These things, they say, are your common duty and delight. It's the charge to the ordinands, the kind of uh, commissioning, you are going to do this. And David issues um, a kind of charge at the end of his life. He, Solomon is... Uh, uh, gathered to him, we presume. We're just told that David is uh, on his, literally his very last uh, legs, he's on his deathbed. And he passes on a charge to Solomon uh, in verse 2 and 4. These are the things, Solomon, you must do when you ascend the throne. And um, uh, within that charge, you get what is, is classic uh, Deuteronomist, Deuteronomistic, that's a word I've learnt this week or still can't pronounce, uh, theology, which basically means if you read the book of uh, Deuteronomy, um, which is a, a, a repetition really of the book of Leviticus, the, the, rules in, the rules and laws for God's people in Deuteronomy are positioned as such, if you do this, you will be blessed. If you don't do this, you will be cursed. That's the kind of um, way that they're set out. And so David is saying, um, if you do this, if you are faithful, if you keep the law, if you walk in the ways of the Lord, you will be blessed in return. And throughout the whole book of Kings, um, much later on, past the portion that we'll get to, when the various um, uh, uh, incumbencies of the throne are written up in little biographies, um, they will say, and he did not do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord, or he did do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord. And that phrase, that, that summing up, that biography, um, that judgment is always made against, um, on the, the king's faithfulness to the covenant promises. The mark of a successful king in Israel, Judah, in this time, is how faithful a king was to the promises and commands of the Lord. And in detail, David says this. He says, um, uh, make sure you're walking in the ways of the Lord your God and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses. Now, of course, that charge, yes, is given to uh, one person in a, in a historical setting, but actually, the essence 
um, and the spirit of that charge is given to all of us who want to live faithfully uh, before God. If we, if we uh, want to live a faithful Christian life, then we will walk in the ways of the Lord, will we not? We'll act out the values of the kingdom of God, justice, kindness. Um, we'll uh, seek a righteousness in the way we deal with one another, not manipulating or trying to rip people off. We will keep the statutes and the commandments of the Lord, will we not, as best as we are able. Uh, we will be faithful to the law of the Lord, the spirit of it at least. So all that, that Solomon is charged with to be a faithful God-honouring king, you and I are charged with to be faithful and God-honouring people, loving and serving the Lord with our all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And so here, because it's in the tradition of the De Deuteronomistic theologians, there is blessing that's promised for faithfulness. Now, here it's in the context of reward. If you do this, you'll get this. If you do this, everything will go nicely. And... Um, that, that would be quite an appealing state to live in. It would make life so much simple, wouldn't it? If only we just did X, Y, and Z, then the Lord would promise to give us A, B, and C. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? There are some Christians that seem to um, suggest that that's the way faith is worked out. If you pay enough money here to this ministry, the Lord will guarantee your health and wealth and prosperity. It's utter cabbage, isn't it? Nonsense. Look at the one person who has only fully walked in the ways of the Lord and kept the commandments and statutes of the Lord fully. Well, he didn't exactly live in a prosperity. The Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head, says St. Matthew. Didn't all go well for him, did it? He got strung up on a cross after being whipped to a pulp. So we know that that, that doesn't work. So he, so here it's in the kind of context of the reward. If you'll do this, God will reward you. But actually, we also know that living a faithful life before God, uh, living to the values of the kingdom of God, actually leads to a life of a blessing. Anyway, it leads to a life of fulfillment. So I, I think I've used this illustration before. Um, you know, I... Uh, my mobile phone is filming me at the minute it's, uh, and um, it's a phenomenal piece of kit um, it's a, an, an iPhone whatever it is I can't even remember the model and um, I remember the time when you when I first got a mobile phone I was quite happy if it made a phone call and occasionally sent a text message and now I, I kind of wonder if I pointed my phone at a roast chicken, a frozen chicken, it would probably cook it for me. You know, it's so sophisticated a piece of equipment. And actually, I, I don't have the wherewithal to use it fully. Now, it comes with an online manual. They don't even print paper manuals these days. But if I want to, I could take a picture of a little QR code and it will bring me up on my computer this lovely manual that will tell me how to get the best out of this phenomenal piece of technology. But because I'm a man, I don't read user manuals for things. Uh, I know better. And so, in essence, I've, yeah, I know my way around this bits of technology, uh, more or less. But there are other people that know far more about how they can be used and how you can maximise them. If I'd only bothered to read the maker's instructions, I could achieve or, or uh, do even more uh, than I already know how to do. And uh, that's a, a fairly tenuous illustration, but you know, the Bible gives us a user manual for life. It gives us the maker's instructions. It gives us the principles by which we live well in relationship to the planet, its resources, and to one another, and of course to God. And so by keeping the maker's instructions, we begin to, to use our life, our body, live our lives uh, as they were designed to be lived. And that is the way to fulfilment and to blessing. It isn't a kind of like, do A, B, C, you get C, D, E. But if we live as, if, as though God intended us to live, 
we will know the maximum fulfilment that he desired for us. And I wonder, um, it's just worth uh, pausing for a moment and reflecting maybe, and to what extent are we living our lives according to the maker's instructions? If you forgive the tenuous extension of this illustration, are there some little bits of the user manual that we could do with refreshing our memory on so that we live life as the maker designed it to be lived? Maybe let's ponder that for just a moment. And now we get into the political bloodbath. Um, so remember that God has designated Solomon as king through the words of the prophet. You know, there will be, uh, uh, your son will reign on David's throne forever. And we, of course, um, receive and apply that prophetic hope to Jesus the Messiah. We think about those prophecies, I think we have thought about them once here in this group as they apply to Jesus, particularly around Christmas time. And Solomon, Solomon's name literally means man of peace. And here is this man who is designated by God as king, um, yet uh, there are people all over the place vying for the power uh, vacuum that is left by David's death. I spoke more about that two or three weeks ago, so don't need to go over it all again. But by setting out all the scheming that's gone on, Joab has killed this person, he's killed this person, um, uh, you know, this person has, has manipulated that and deserves to be punished for this, that person needs to go down to the grave before their hairs are grey, and all this malarkey. Um, Solomon is established clearly as God's choice over and above the desires and the designs of others. God will have his way. God's will will be done. And of course Solomon's accession to the throne represents the hope of the kingdom of God. What God has promised will come to pass whatever the efforts of human beings. And it may well be that some of us in our own individual lives have, you know, maybe somebody's given us a word of scripture at an opportune time, or even maybe somebody has, has given us a, a, a kind of a prophetic word or a word of knowledge. This, the Lord is going to do this, and it's just had a deep um, witness with your spirit. What God has promised, he will accomplish. Let me remind you of that today. What God has promised, he will accomplish. Despite the best efforts of Adonijah and Joab and all sorts of other people, Solomon is positioned on the throne. And of course, if you're a, a, a Calvinist or somebody that, that wants to put more emphasis on the sovereignty of God than the free will of human beings, then this is an example uh, within Scripture of God just sovereignly choosing somebody for such a time as this. Someone who is undeserving, unmerited, but God graciously plucks them out of obscurity. The child of an ill-judged relationship and plops them in the centre of God's purposes and God's will. There is nobody too obscure for the Lord to put his hand on. There is nobody outside the scope of his ability to use them. And so Solomon's accession to the throne is a reminder of that. that God's sovereign will will be done. He uses who he chooses. And if he promises uh, to use you, he will do it. 
And then lastly, um, heading sooner than I expected towards a close, um, there is the subject and the theme of leadership here because even when Solomon has been crowned king, it doesn't stop others for jostling for power and influence. Um, Adonijah is still on manoeuvres, we might say. He's still scheming and uh, his scheming um, is uh, linked to his desire for Abishag, the Shunammite, who we'll come back to in um, uh, a few uh, minutes' time. And it just shows, as I think probably we've all known and realised, that leadership is more about personality and influence than it is about position. You know, leadership is an anointing from the Lord. It's a gift of grace. It's more that than an appointment to a position. Um, And all of us, I imagine, in our working lives, I certainly can think of instances where I might have worked for somebody who was, uh, in theory, the person I answered to. They were in a position of leadership. They had the title, superintendent, district chair, whatever it might be. Uh, But actually, they didn't have the gifts and graces to lead. They'd got to that position. It wasn't their fault. They they put there um, and they did it to the best of their ability. They were as faithful as they possibly could be. But actually, they just didn't have the skill or the the anointing or the gifting uh, for leadership. And perhaps in our own work lives, we might be able to think of people like that that almost were unfortunately stuck in that position and you kind of got the sense that it wasn't really good for them and it certainly wasn't good for everybody else. Um, but for here, uh, Solomon is, is gifted. He seems to have a, a gifting of leadership and that uh, part of that gifting is his desire, as we'll look at in the next couple of weeks, uh, for him to receive wisdom from God. And that sense that um, God must supply what he needs in order to lead well. And of course, Solomon will need to use all of that charisma and charm and wisdom to navigate the difficult and vulnerable terrain of a new monarchy. This wasn't like, you know, when Prince Charles uh, secedes um, to the throne or accedes to the throne, whichever term is the correct one. Um, We expect there to be a peaceful transition of power and actually very little will change in our day-to-day lives. That's the expectation anyway. Here, Solomon may well have been crowned by David. Of course, that was significant. But actually, he needed to establish himself and make sure the the enemies and those that are opposed to him uh, were quickly eliminated. Otherwise, he was in a vulnerable position. And so we came back, come back to Joab, who is a skilled political leader. Verse 5 and verse 6 is where we get uh, uh, some write-up about him. And we're being told that he's been involved in lots of shady dealings. He's killed one person, he's seen off another one, he's, you know, he's done lots of different things uh, to make sure that he rises to power. We've got Adonijah, his request to take Abishag the Shunammite, the, um, uh, the lady that has... Um, led next to David to keep him warm. You'll remember from the first uh, chapter, very innovative idea. Um, By Adonijah saying to Solomon through Bathsheba, "Um, could I have her now, please? He's actually saying, by taking one of David's wives or concubines, he's in effect saying, I want to take David's position. I'm taking David's place. Solomon sees that as an opportunity to consolidate his power and to rid himself of Adonijah's subversive behaviour and so he has Adonijah killed. Um, In closing, it's both good and difficult, I think, that we get an honest write-up of what's going on. (laughs) It's difficult because I'm reading this thinking, how can all this murder and scheming and putting down a one family and raising up another be part of the Lord's good purposes? So it's difficult. But it's good on the other hand because the Bible doesn't airbrush its heroes. The Bible paints a brutally honest picture 
of uh, those whom God uses, warts and all, misjudgments and all. And that's a great uh, encouragement if you're somebody like me, who is just all too aware of the many warts, metaphorically speaking, I'm not talking about my medical history, uh, that all of us carry. Here, in all that's going on, the writer wants to make clear that God is the hero. In everything that's going on, it is God who ordains Solomon to be king at this uh, appointed time. It is God who is faithful to the promise he made to David that his throne would endure forever. And we are beneficiaries of that promise because a descendant through Solomon and through the Davidic line uh, was born of Joseph. And he is a man who lived a, a faithful life, blameless, keeping all the statutes and commandments of the Lord, walking in the way of the Lord fully before being strung out to die on a cross to win our salvation. And it is God who charges us with, despite all the scheming and manipulation and power grabs that are going on in our world, despite the brokenness and mess ups of our households and our families, it is God that still charges you and me with living faithful, God-honouring lives wherever we find ourselves, loving God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength, living as the Maker instructed us to do, that we might find fulfilment and know God's blessing in our lives as well. Let's pray together. Father, we can all think of times of political chaos that we have lived through, whether they be recent or whether they be in the annals of history. How grateful we are that you remain on the throne and they were not just at the behest of who is rising through the political ranks at the time. Thank you that you remain sovereign, that you are just and good and faithful. Thank you that the promises you've made to us, you keep. You fulfil your promises. You are faithful. That which you have said will come to pass. Remind us of those things that you've spoken over our lives or in the lives, over the lives of those that we love. Encourage us with them in the days to come and inspire us with your spirit to live faithful, God-honouring lives wherever it is that you've placed us and with whomever we mix. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.